Good evening, everyone. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to the National Constitution Center this evening. My name is Charlene Myers. I'm a professor of history at Rutgers Camden, and I'm the editor-in-chief of the Encyclopedia of Greater Philadelphia. And it's our great pleasure to be co-sponsoring the series of films of which this is a part. Um, you may know that the program we're having this evening is part of a continuing series of film and discussion programs titled Created Equal, um, to which we add a question mark in order to spur our thinking and uh, creative engagement with the idea of equality and how it has manifested itself in American history. We are presenting these programs this year, 2015, as a commemoration of the 150th anniversary of the 13th Amendment to the Constitution, which ended slavery. So our venue this evening is especially fitting. The documentaries we showcase are films that have been produced with support from the National Endowment for the Humanities, the NEH. Um, it, the programs are supported by a grant from the NEH and um, together with the Gilder Lehrman Institute of American History. The local partners, in addition to the encyclopedia, are the African American Museum in Philadelphia, the Philadelphia History Museum, the Historical Society of Pennsylvania, and the National Constitution Center. By being here this evening, you're part of a discussion that's taking place in communities all over the country that are showing the four particular documentaries that have been featured here in Philadelphia in this series as well. The documentaries are all uh, films that connect the stories of the long civil rights movement, from abolitionism to contemporary issues. And together they tell a remarkable story about the importance of race in the making of American democracy, about the power of individuals to affect change, and about the ways that Americans have understood and struggled with ideas of freedom, equality, and citizenship. And that's certainly the case of our film this evening, Freedom Riders. This is a film by Stanley Nelson that was produced in 2011 for the American Experience series. So this evening we'll be seeing excerpts from the film. We have a really marvelous panel discussion with two veterans of the Freedom Rides, as well in, as an expert in African American history. And following our panel discussion, we will continue uh, discussion among ourselves in the exhibit that the Constitution Center is now featuring, Creating Camelot, the Kennedy Photography of Jacques Lowe, which gives us a very different image of the same period in American history. So I think it will be fascinating to consider these um, contrasting images of the early 1960s. Uh, so before making further introductions, I'd like to invite our panels, panelists and our moderator to join me on stage. Are we bringing everyone on now? So our panelists this evening uh, will introduce in alphabetical order. We have Dion Diamond, who before joining the Freedom Riders was a physics major at Howard University. He was not a career civil rights activist, but a student doing his part. He rode the Greyhound bus from Montgomery, Alabama to Jackson, Mississippi, as a part of the Freedom Ride on May 24, 1961. He, along with the rest of the bus riders, was arrested on their arrival to Jackson and sent to the Mississippi State Prison in Parchment. After his experience with the Freedom Riders, Dion served as the SNCC Field Secretary in Louisiana and Mississippi from 1961 to 1963. He was a member of the Nonviolent Action Group, NAG, in the D.C. area in 1960 before his experience with the Freedom Riders. And that group worked to end Jim Crow laws in the District of Columbia suburbs in 1960. We also have with us this evening my colleague, Dr. Wayne Glasker, who's associate professor at Rutgers University in Camden. He specializes in African-American history and 20th century United States history. 
He's an author of the book Black Students in the Ivory Tower, African-American Student Activism at the University of Pennsylvania, 1967 to 1990. And he's currently working on a new book about Malcolm X, James Baldwin, and the critique of colorblind integration. Also on our panel, another Freedom Rides veteran, the Reverend Reginald Green. While a student at Virginia Union, Reverend Green participated in student sit-ins in Richmond, Virginia during the early 1960s. In 1961, he participated in the Freedom Rides, was arrested and spent 29 days in Jackson, Mississippi's Hines County Jail and the Parchman Penitentiary. After his release from jail, he met Martin, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in Atlanta, Georgia. After 40 years as pastor of Walker Memorial Baptist Church in Washington, D.C., Reverend Green retired in 2006, but he has served as the interim pastor of Jerusalem Baptist Church in Washington from 2008 to 2012, and currently serves as the interim pastor of First Rising Mount Zion Baptist Church, also in Washington. He was the first recipient of the District Citywide Citizens Assembly Award in 1976 for outstanding service in housing and community development for the citizens of the District Columbia. And more recently, in 2003, he was the recipient of the Pillar of Faith Award by the Howard University School of Divinity. Moderating our panel tonight, uh, we have Curry Sautner. She is the Vice President of Visitor Experience and Education here at the National Constitution Center. She, is, um, she leads the Visitor Experience team. She manages the museum's Annenberg Center for Education and Outreach. So if you've been to the Constitution, you've been enjoying the fruits of her work. Um, she also has served as an adjunct professor of education at Drexel University. Um, so I'm very pleased to be, I have the honor of introducing this wonderful panel to you, and I will turn the conversation over to Curry Sautner. Thank you so much. So as we begin, I just have to stop and pause and say that this is absolutely, I'm like checking the moment here and saying what a highlight of my experience here at the center that I get to be on stage with these three brilliant, amazing people. If our conversation tonight is any reflection of the wonderful conversation we had back in the green room. It is going to be a wonderful night. Everything about the Constitution Center is all about this wonderful document that we understand, that we look at, and that we view every day, and what holds our laws of our land together. But it's really about the undercurrent and the human beings that make those words real. The actions of the people on this stage and the research of this man right here really tell us the story of how this document affects our lives. And this is a great moment that we get to have, where we get to see an amazing film, and then instead of just watching people on screen that tell their story, we get to talk to them one-on-one -on -one in, in real time. So I feel very honored and very lucky. And as the person in charge of education here, I am every single day looking for ways to educate myself. So I'll be really excited about all the things that I learned tonight. Now, one of the things, I want to give you a little kind of housekeeping of the way we're going to do this tonight. We're going to do um, 10 clips of the show Freedom Riders. It is online at pbs.org, and you can watch it at any point in time and watch the entire thing. But tonight, we're just going to take three, ten, sorry, let me say that right, three 10-minute clips. And we're going to intersperse them with questions. The first few questions will probably come from me and kind of pulling out the story behind the pieces. The third time when we ask for questions, we're going to be asking from the audience. So please, if there's anything that pops into your head, our staff is here, and they will give you white cards. Just raise your hand. Um, take a white card if you don't already have one. Write down your question, and we'll ask those towards the end. But that is not it. This is like a grand night that we have. When we're done the conversation here with the film screening, we're going to actually move downstairs to the Kennedy exhibit. The exhibits that we bring in here are always helping us tell a story, and I find this one very fascinating. It's telling the story of 1961 to 1963 in a very particular lens. It is the images that were taken by Kennedy's personal photographer, and it's cre creating Camelot is the name of it, and that's really what it's doing. So what we do as educators here is we like to tell all the stories and understand very clearly what you all know is that you have to look at many primary sources to really understand what was happening during a time period. And if you look at one, it can be very, very one-sided, and lots of things are different. And you don't get the full story. 
So we'll be looking at those images down there, and we'll be having these other primary sources and a brilliant secondary source to really shape our understanding of that time period. And also, I ask all of you, if you have any stories, if you have anything to share, this is a community conversation, and we want to have these conversations together. So sound like a deal? Plan? OK, I'm very interactive, so I'm gonna, I work with kids all the time, so I'm going to point you to you and ask you questions. Um, so please, please hold me to that. So let's get started. So you've heard the bios, um, the Dr. Reverend Green um, and everybody on the panel, but let's hear a little bit about why they did this. So I was back there, and I was talking to them, and one of the first things that comes to mind is, what did your parents say? I mean, I would freak out if I heard my child wanted to be a freedom riser, and that's just panic, that's fear. But the answer that I got to that question was very different than what I expected. Um, so, Reverend, what, what did your parents say, and how did they find out? Because I think this is fascinating. Good evening, and Good evening. let me thank uh, those who put on this, this program, because I think it's important that we hear as much as we can about real time and the experiences of those whose memory is still intact, who can still share the stories about what happened in their experience as Freedom Riders. Um, my first, I was 21 when I was arrested on June 7th, but my father uh, had no idea that I had gone on the Freedom Rides. Uh, he, he discovered it through, in Washington, D.C., we had like three, two major newspapers and one other. It was the Washington Post was your morning paper, uh, the Evening Star was your evening paper, and then we had a Washington Daily News. Then, of course, we had the Afro-American newspaper and Pittsburgh Courier uh, from the uh, black press. And so those were the news media that we had. No cell phones, no, no uh, iPods, none, none, none of that. And so when my when the reporter found the names of persons uh, and the, the, where they were from, uh, they contacted my dad, and this is a story from my father, about uh, whether he had a son named Reginald Green. And he couldn't deny that because uh, uh, that would be blasphemous. But he found out through the reporter that and this reporter said to my dad, I need to come and talk with you uh, to share some more information about your son. And when he got to my home on East Capitol Street Northeast in Washington, my father discovered then that instead of, as he told the reporter about my working in Richmond, Virginia, because I was earning more money to return to school, in the fall did he find out from the reporter that I was in jail in Mississippi. Uh, he would later, of course, get a letter. But in most of our letters we wrote, at least from my perspective, they were always addressed to uh, the mother. Uh, and in passing would ask, tell dad hello. Uh, tell him everything's OK. And that's how he found out uh, uh, that I was in jail uh, in Mississippi, in Hines County and then Parchment uh, Penitentiary. Uh, so, but, but that's how it happened, how he discovered it. Uh, there's much more to it than that, but I'll just leave it at that. And when we come to some other uh, questions, we'll deal with it mostly. So, um, thank you so much. That was great. Um, Mr. Diamond, the, you were is studying physics, is that correct? Yes. So, <clears throat> question for you, what, what was that moment that you felt that you had to go do this? What kind of spoke to you that said, I'm going to go do this, and I'm going to be a part of the Freedom Rides? Well, prior to the Freedom Ride, um, I was a physics major at Howard University in the District of Columbia. And in 1960, prior to the Freedom Ride, um, the sit-in movement started in Greensboro, North Carolina, and spread throughout the South at mostly um, black institutions. But being at Howard in Washington, D.C., segregation was not the law, even though it probably existed. But we thought, why is it that we at Howard University, supposedly the epitome, the zenith in um, black education, were doing nothing? 
well, if you went across the Potomac River into Virginia, segregation was indeed in full fling. So uh, about 10 of us Howard students decided that, hey, let's go over to Virginia and stage some sit-ins. Um, the first sit-in was at a drug fair and people's drugstore lunch counter. Um, it took us two weeks after being surrounded by George Lincoln Rockwell and the American Nazi Party, um, spitting on us, taunting us, um, for the city to, to cave in and integrate not only the lunch counters but the restaurants in Northern Virginia. As a result of that and uh, feeling flush you know, with victory, we said, well, Maryland is really next door. Let's go to Maryland. There was a amusement park called Glen Echo, which was on the outskirts of um, Washington, D.C. in Montgomery County, Maryland, and that didn't allow persons of color into the park. Um, as I suggested previously, I think one of the main reasons was they had a huge swimming pool. They did not want males of color in the same swimming pool as white females. That was one of the reasons they truly tried to, to keep the park segregated. At any rate, um, for that entire summer of 1960, we picketed and tried to get them to drop that policy of segregation. Um, that's the summer of 1960. When the park closed for the summer, in the May of the following year, the, the, the Freedom Rides had already started, and I said, well, they have burned the bus in Anniston, Alabama, and they are about to stop the, city, um, the Freedom Ride. Um, I said, well, we can't allow this ride to stop. So I joined with a few others to pick up the ride. A lot, a lot of people from Nashville, Tennessee, a lot of people um, from other locations joined in the ride. Now, you have to understand something, please, because quite frankly, people ask me, oh, you were a freedom rider. Did you know so-and-so? Now, quite frankly, initially, there were only two buses that went into Jackson. On each bus, there were about 13 or 14 of us. When we got arrested, we were divided into white males in one set of cells, black males in another set of cells, white females in one set of cells, and white males in another. The only freedom riders that I ever knew were the people who were on the bus with me. With day after day after day and bus after bus and bus, we didn't see them. So when, when people ask, us, did you know so and so, the answer is probably no. There were 409 persons who were, approximately 409 persons who became freedom riders over a four month period of time, um, as I said. I was arrested on the very first day that we got into Jackson, Mississippi. Um, I think as has been pointed out, as a result of my thinking I was taking a long weekend, um, it took two years and change before I decided, hey, it's time for me to get back in school. Um, I never got back to Howard, by the way. Um, I ended up in undergrad school at the University of Wisconsin. Still physics? No. <laughs> <laughs> As a result of my exposure to um, Southern hospitality, <laughs> I, um, <laughs> I um, decided that I wanted to find out why did it take 100 years since the Emancipation Proclamation to find out why there was a concerted effort, an organized effort, to bring about um, desegregation. And um, I changed my major to American History and Sociology, Civil War and Reconstruction and Sociology. Um, and that took care of my undergrad career. I might, I might add, as a result of my exposure to the, quote, Southern hospitality, you know how you apply for a federal job, or perhaps now in almost any job? They ask of, have you ever been arrested? I put down, I've been arrested approximately 30 times. Please check with the FBI for dates and location. <laughs> <laughs> it is a perfect lead-in to the historian of the group. So the question I have for you, and you can do this as a historian, you can look back at a time period and look at all the materials and kind of use a modern day lens to understand the impact. Can you, how 
Can you give us a sense and a range of how much of an impact that the Freedom Riders and the sit-ins and the bus count the counters did for not just our society, but almost a global society in changing the way we see protests and the way we see change in the world? Okay, well, let me say that prior to the Freedom Rides, uh, most of America just wanted to ignore what was happening in the South. The country did, really did not want to know that there was segregation uh, and that there was injustice. And we wanted to, to think that if you just give it enough time, it, it will solve itself and we don't need to do anything. But when people saw, for example, the photograph of the bus being burned in Anniston, that, that was impossible to ignore. And I would add that the Kennedy administration wanted to ignore what was happening. But it's hard to ignore a photograph of a burning bus. Uh, and then the attacks in places like Birmingham and, and people being arrested in Jackson forced the nation to confront what was happening in the South. And I would add that uh, the Freedom Riders were American citizens who were simply doing what they had the right to do under the Constitution. A Supreme Court decision had said that you cannot have segregation uh, in facilities that are involved in interstate travel. And this is interstate travel. Commerce Clause, uh, yay. Exactly. <laughs> and, and, and even though the Supreme Court had said this, nevertheless, the South was violating the Supreme Court decision. It was not complying with the Supreme Court decision. So whose job is it to enforce the rulings of the Supreme Court? That's the job of the president. Uh, and the Kennedy administration didn't want to deal with this, but the Freedom Rides forced the Kennedy administration uh, to pay attention to the issue and to actually take action to enforce the rule of law. Perfect. Now, we're going to see the first clip of the Freedom Rides that really set up some of the experiences that were happening. So I have always wanted to say, roll that footage, A.V. <laughs> I wish to apply for acceptance as a participant in CORE's Freedom Ride, 1961. To travel via bus from Washington, D.C. to New Orleans, Louisiana, and to test and challenge segregated facilities en route. I understand that I should be participating in a nonviolent protest against racial discrimination, that arrest or personal injury to me might result the Freedom Rides of 1961 were a simple but daring plan. The Congress of Racial Equality came up with the idea to put blacks and whites in small groups on commercial buses, and they would deliberately violate the segregation laws of the Deep South. We were to go through various parts of the South, gradually going deeper and deeper, six of us on the Trailways bus and six of us on the Greyhound bus and see whether places were segregated, whether people were being served when they went to get something to eat or buy a ticket or use the restrooms. One of the major thrusts of the Freedom Ride was to get the movement into the Deep South. Most, most of the action up to, up to this time had been in the Upper South or in the North. And one of the ideas here was to go into the deepest South we were hoping that this would start a national movement. CORE had this set itinerary. They anticipated that this would be a two-week trip, that it would culminate down in New Orleans with a real celebration on the anniversary of the Brown versus Board of Education decision. And there's almost an element of naivete attached to it, how easily they thought it would go. I'm a senior at American Baptist Theological Seminary and hope to graduate in June. I know that an education is important, and I hope to get one. But at this time, human dignity is the most important thing in my life, that justice and freedom might come to the deep south. I have no doubt that the Negro basically knows that the best friend he's ever had in the world is a southern white man. We talk about it here as separation of the races. Customs and traditions that have been built up over the last hundred years that 
have proved for the best interests of both the colored and the white people. There's not been one single change. The colored man knows where he stands. The white man knows where he stands. We have signs saying colored and white. The colored man knows that he is not to enter there. Well, the nigger's all right in his place, but they've always been behind us. And just tell you the truth, I want them always stay behind me because I never have loved a nigger, mister. You cannot change a way of life overnight. The more they try to force us into doing something, then the worse the reaction will be. Our colored people will do exactly as they've done. Our white people will do exactly as they've done. Why? Because it's worked out best. It was all encompassing, this so-called Southern way of life. I would not allow for any breaks. Um, it was a, a system that was only as strong, the white Southerners thought, as its weakest link. So you couldn't allow people even to sit together on the front of a bus, something that really shouldn't have threatened anyone, but it did. It threatened their sense of the wholeness, the sanctity of what they saw as an age-old tradition. Travel in the segregated South for black people was humiliating. The very fact that uh, there were separate facilities was to say to black people and white people, that blacks were so subhuman and so inferior that we could not even use public facilities that white people used. The Supreme Court even said that there was no right that a black person had that white people had to respect. You didn't know what you were going to encounter. You had night riders, you had uh, hoodlums. Uh, you could be antagonized at any point in your journey. So most of the time, it was very, very difficult to plan a trip. And, you know, you always had to meet someone to meet you there because you didn't know what to expect. We're rolling along the highway. There is very adventure in every wonderful mile. We're gliding along the highway, lighthearted and green streamlined style. My father traveled quite a bit, and he just wanted a cup of coffee to make it to Montgomery. And he had to go around the back of the cafe to get a cup of coffee, and then they told him. I'm sorry, our management does not allow us to serve niggers in here. Pushed them all out the door. It's a wonderful house. I grew up in the South, child of good and decent parents. We had women who worked in our household, sometimes surrogate mothers. They were invisible women to me. I can't believe I couldn't see them. I don't know where my head or heart was. I don't know where my Parents' heads and hearts were on my teachers. I never heard it once from the pulpit. We were blind to the reality of racism and afraid, I guess, of change. go forth from this time and place to friend and foe alike that the torch has been passed to a new generation of Americans. When John Kennedy was elected in November of 1960, there was great hope and expectation that things would be better on matters of civil rights, that there was a contrast between him and Dwight Eisenhower. He was young and had ideas and talked about the new frontier. 
Uh, but when he gave his inaugural address in January of 1961, he talked about spreading freedom all over the world to China, to Latin America, to Africa, to everywhere but Alabama and Mississippi and Georgia. The base of the Democratic Party was the essentially white voting South. The Kennedys had to be careful about antagonizing Southern governors and the whole Southern establishment, which was segregationist. Uh, I was the first governor in the, in the South that uh, publicly endorsed him for president. I think he's a person who is sympathetic to the uh, problems and conditions in the South. I think he's a man who will work with us down here. To help I knew that you couldn't run for president on a segregation ticket. So I knew that. But I, f I felt like that if we ever got uh, in a situation where we needed uh, some understanding and, uh, and some, some help from the federal government in regard to our problems down here, that I'd get, a good, I'd get an audience. The entire nation will be looking at us on election day and will judge the way we feel about the segregation question by the size of the Democratic vote on November the 4th. Let's turn out the largest Democratic vote in the history of the state and show the people of this nation that we are not going to tolerate integration of the races one minute. The Kennedys, when they came into office, were not worried about civil rights. They were worried about the Soviet Union. They were worried about the Cold War. They were worried about the nuclear threat. When civil rights did pop up, they regarded it as a bit of a nuisance, as something that was getting in the way of their agenda. It became clear that the civil rights leaders had to do something desperate, uh, something dramatic to get the Kennedys' attention. So that was the idea behind the Freedom Rides, to dare, the, essentially, dare the federal government uh, to do what it was supposed to do and see if their constitutional rights will be protected by the Kennedy administration. So as we look at this and as we look, we talked about the Commerce Clause, we spoke about the Constitution needs to be enforced. The, the Freedom Riders and the organization that is putting these young people into the South is calculatingly pushing the idea of crossing state boundaries, of really pushing these federal laws and making the federal state pay attention. But what was going on in the country at that time? It did not start off this way. The federal government was not paying attention. Where's that tipping point, that moment where things start to change? And where's that moment, and this question is for you, sorry, <laughs> I should have really, the, um, Where's that moment where it goes from a few brave people willing to leave school, not tell their parents, um, and, <laughs> and go and risk their lives to change things because they have to do something? Where does it go from the moment where the country starts paying attention and the government must pay attention? Well, you know, of course, President Kennedy is doing a very delicate balancing act. Uh, I think that the firebombing of the bus in Anniston really caught people's attention. And the Kennedy administration tried to stop the Freedom Rides. Uh, but then the second wave of, of young people from Washington, D.C., from Nashville, uh, Diane Nash, that that brought new life into the Freedom Rides. They continued. And the Kennedy administration could not stop them. And so for the media, as more and more people continued to get on the bus and continued to be arrested, and there continue to be racial incidents. I mean, the Freedom Riders were attacked in Birmingham. And Bull Connor pulled away the police uh, to allow the Ku Klux Klan to attack the Freedom Riders. And so, and, I mean, there were people overseas, for example, in Japan, who pick up a newspaper and it shows what's happening in Birmingham. The whole world learned about the Freedom Rides. And so the Kennedy administration could not ignore what was happening, especially because the young people continued all through the summer, more than 400 people all the way through August, to get on the buses, to be arrested, to push the administration to enforce the law. And really what the Freedom Rides were trying to do was to awaken the sleeping conscience of America. And to be more precise, to awaken the sleeping conscience of white America. Uh, and the Freedom Rides forced people to pay attention to what was doing and to put pressure on the Kennedy administration to enforce the law. Now, um, thank you. That was perfect. Um, Mr. Diamond, the, what, when you were there at that moment, wh did you see hope in Kennedy when, it, when he was first elected? What, what were your personal feelings 
on that, that angle? Truly, I was hopeful. I mean, I, um, Kennedy had this image of, you know, youth, vitality. He was from Massachusetts, um, liberal state. We expected a lot. But you hit on something that uh, was very poignant. President Kennedy, through his brother, um, the Attorney General, literally called Diane Nash on the telephone, made, sent his special assistant, not um, Bobby Kennedy's special assistant, Salting Bowler, um, really tried to get us to stop. The reason being, Kennedy was about to meet with Khrushchev. As you said, Kennedy wanted to spread democracy to the world. How could he meet with Khrushchev and tell Khrushchev that, hey, you guys got to open up? When all of, it, all of the, the segregation and the, the, I suppose I can only say the, the resistance to integration in, in the South, he couldn't very well do that. But he tried literally to get us to stop, go home. Um, and I, I think, uh, I don't know, I, with my back to the screen, I, I don't know if that was Salton Paula um, on the screen. Yeah, um, but, but at any rate, um, he got hurt. Um, you know, our, our biggest salvation back then was the press, the cameramen on TV, um, and they, all of a sudden, they were as much in peril as the Freedom Riders because everyone of the segregationists knew that if their pictures were taken and spread all over the world, you know, they too could be prosecuted. But I mean, that's what I got disenchanted who with the Kennedy administration, because obviously I understand politics and you have to dance, um, a very precarious dance in this particular situation. And unfortunately, he didn't dance the way we had hoped he would dance. Uh, no, Reverend, um, and, and we're gonna see this in the next clip that we look at and gonna look very closely at what's going on with the cameraman as well. But uh, Reverend, you, when you go into the South and you're looking at the peril that you may be going into, and when you think about, it's not only just the federal government's job to protect the people, but also the police force. And how were your feelings about when you saw the police force when you were on the rides? And how is that experience very different than, and maybe, maybe the same as than when people see the police today? What was that like to see police that weren't there to protect and serve? Well, let, let me speak to this this way. Uh, the three of us that were on the bus, the trailway bus from Richmond, see, I left from Richmond mm -hmm. to go to Mississippi. Uh, and these were commercial buses we're talking about. They're not charter buses, this whole experience. So we, my group didn't really meet any activity or problem with uh, going into Mississippi until we got maybe about five or 10 minutes from getting into Jackson. And they had, in those days, what we called transistor radios. Uh, not this fancy stuff. And, and you put it up. Who knows what he's talking about? Anybody know what a transistor radio is? Yeah, OK. I love, I love mine. And they, were put, they had the mic on the bus that the, uh, the bus driver communicated with the passengers. And you heard this voice coming across on the airwaves saying, there's some more Negroes and some more Negro lovers, some more of those so-and-so freedom riders. Now, these are public airways we're talking about. Uh, coming into jail, they can have a difficult time, or they can uh, make it, or they can have it easier if they just acted like they should. The whole idea then is, of course, this whole position was jail, not bail. We could just fill up the jails. Uh, and so the intent was, to go in, if you're white, you go into a colored section, as they were referred to, or the Negro section uh, in the uh, bus station, or you went to uh, the white section if you're African American, uh, knowing that you weren't going to be served, uh, and you would be arrested. And, and it didn't take but a minute or so before you were arrested and carted out uh, to jail and taken to Hines County Jail and later shipped out to Parks and Penitentiary. So we didn't really see police force in, in terms, only until that, that, that sheriff came up and said, well, 
y'all can move now. You're not going to be served. You know you're breaking the law. And if you didn't move, then you were arrested. And, and that's what happened in, in our case. The other thing I wanted to speak to, though, that, that you touched on earlier, and that is that about the Kennedy administration. You know, there's a kind of, a, you know, close to a parallelism. Uh, when you think about the Kennedy's reservation in trying to walk that tightrope to the, how he deals with the Cold War and Khrushchev and, and the Soviet Union versus these nuisance uh, people called Freedom Riders, uh, how does he deal with that? It's almost like when Lincoln was facing with uh, the breakup of the Union. And, uh, and was losing the war until it was finally discovered in order for me to save the Union, then what? I've got to make sure that U.S. colored troops can join forces. So the reservation of Lincoln in terms of, because had he been able to deal with the war, the war, I, I think we may have a different story in terms of what happened uh, in the Civil War era. Same thing with, with, with Kennedy. And thanks be to God that you had these students, many of them trained in nonviolence in Nashville, and a fellow named Jim Lawson, who was really the one who did much of the training there in Nashville, students from Tennessee State and, 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 and the like, and we could go on and on. So they were the ones, because you knew now that you were at risk, even of death, if you went. And so uh, the challenge was, those of us who have seen now what could happen were still willing to go on the rides because you knew, number one, that you could get hurt, you could be maimed, you could be beaten, you could lose your life. But there was something about, uh, Zion used the term youthful exuberance, he calls it. Uh, but my whole feeling was that if I'm going to be trained for ministry, if that's going to be my field, then I must always understand ministry having a social context. That you can't talk religion and salvation without understanding that there's a social component to that. And that's what I saw going on with us. And that's why uh, many of us did go on the rides. So we're going to move on to our next clip that really talks about the violence that was happening and it really shows it. So let's check out our next clip. And then after that clip, I'm going to turn it over to you because I think it's perfect timing for the audience to ask questions. So if you have any questions, write them down now, raise your hand and our staff will pick them up. Don't you know I am on my way? The first group of Nashville riders make it back to Birmingham from the Tennessee border. There's a second wave of riders from Nashville already there. They've got a terrible problem. Jimmy Hoffa, the leader of the Teamsters Union, says, none of my drivers are going to get on any of those buses. Uh, Greyhound Corporation can't find any drivers willing to get on the bus. Um, so the riders are stuck there, and it's not clear how they're ever going to get out of Birmingham. A menacingly quiet mob grew into the several hundreds outside the terminal. Dozens of police patrol the area and police dogs helped keep the streets clear and the mob back from the terminal. The Negroes went to board the bus finally and the driver stalked off saying he would not make the trip. We were sitting in the white designated waiting room. This was my first encounter face to face with the Ku Klux Klan. They had on white sheets, and their hoods were thrown back. And they walked around in the bus station while we were there, and they stepped on our feet. They threw cold water on our faces. Bobby Kennedy was getting frustrated. He gets word to John Patterson uh, that uh, if the state of Alabama won't protect the Freedom Riders, won't end this crisis, then the federal government would have to do it. They'd have to step in in some way. 
Patterson realizes that he's got to do something. He says, can't you send somebody down to Montgomery to talk to my staff to figure this out? And that opens the way for John Siegenthaler going down to Montgomery to talk with John Patterson. I said, look, Governor, it's, it's just as simple. Uh, if you can't provide them protection and you say you can't, you don't leave us any option. We'll have to provide protection for them. And it will have to be the U.S. Marshals or troops. But he turned immediately to a man seated across the table and said, that's Floyd Mann, my commissioner of safety. Floyd, tell this man these rabble-rousers are asking for trouble and we can't protect them. He said, Governor, I've been in law enforcement all my life. If you tell me to protect them, I'll protect them. It sucked the air out of the room. Patterson's hands are tied because his chief law enforcement official has essentially said, I can protect the Freedom Riders in front of the Kennedy administration's representative. And so Patterson is in a position where he has to act. Around 11 o'clock, I talked to Mr. Sigenthaler, and the governor at that time assured Mr. Sigenthaler that we have the means, the ability, and the will to protect these people. We will make sure that people traveling in interstate commerce and traveling across our highways are not molested and traveling through our cities are not harmed. That's all I asked for. Uh, he said that, uh, that that's they gave us. He gave us his flat word and assurance that that would happen. When we saw all the protection that we had, you know, we got relaxed then. We sung a few freedom songs, and as a matter of fact, I dozed off. That's right, felt uh, safe. Floyd Mann had state troopers leading them and following them. And we had a state trooper helicopter overhead protecting them from overhead and escorted them to the city limits of Montgomery, where we turned them over to the city authorities of Montgomery who guaranteed to us that they would protect them and maintain order themselves at the bus station. I was looking out the window, and I could see the uh, policemen taken off in different direction, and so with the uh, with the helicopter. And we were thinking that some Montgomery policemen was going to uh, come in then, but then we didn't see anyone. Pull into the bus station, uh, it was an eerie feeling. Uh, we, we didn't see anybody. We saw a couple of taxi cabs. Cameraman Maurice Levy, sound man Wee Risser, and I jumped out of our car to photograph the debarking from the bus itself. There was no large crowd around. I asked some of the riders what they intended to do. They said they did not yet know. Then a heavy set man asked me whether I was one of the group. I said I was not. I noticed then that he was holding in his right hand an open penknife. John was getting ready to go to the microphone, and just as he was about to do this, this fella went at one of the fellas that was holding one of the parabolic mics. And he grabbed it out of his hands and he threw it to the ground, stomped on it, and turned and approached one of the photographers and grabbed his camera and yanked on it, and in his doing so, the cameraman fell to the ground, he started kicking and beating him. And that seemed to be the cue. The mob came out and went straight to the reporters and started beating them and kicking them and throwing their cameras down, smashing them on the ground. After we were forced away, that's when the attack on the riders themselves started. It just seemed like just suddenly, they were, we were like, the bus was like surrounded. You could see 
baseball bats and pieces of pipe and hammers and chains. And one fella had a pitchfork. They were like on the feeding frenzy, like you know how sharks are just, they were just crazy. And what really sticks with me were the women. They were screaming, kill them niggas. And they had babies in their arms. You could see baggage being thrown into the air. You could hear screams. My heart was in my throat. I knew suddenly betrayal, disaster. I hope not death. Bobby is getting this in real time uh, as it's happening from his own lieutenants, saying something to the effect, it's terrible, it's terrible. He's watching it happen. Uh, there are no police. They're just beating them. This was war on the Greyhound bus terminal parking lot. This was absolute uh, war. I asked God to be with me, to give me the strength I would need to remain nonviolent and to forgive them. The last thing I recall, standing with Jim Spurred, I was hit in the head with a wooden crate. I heard a crack and fell forward, uh, rolled over on my back, and a foot came down in my face, and that was it. I was out. William Barbee was knocked down. A big 250-pound white guy had his foot on his neck while another one was trying to drive a steel rod through his ear. The police were standing there in their uniforms, just looking. They provided no protection for those students. There is a skinny young kid, and he was sort of dancing in front of this young woman, punching her. And I could see, as she turned her head, blood from the nose and mouth. I grabbed her by the wrist over the hood of the car, had her right at the door, and she put her hands up on the door jamb and said, Mr. I don't want you to get hurt. I'm nonviolent. I'm trained to take this. Please, don't get hurt. We'll be fine. And I said, get your ass in the car, sister. And, <laughs> and at that moment, they wheeled me around, and they hit me with a pipe. They kicked me under the car and left me there. There were from 300 to 1,000 whites in the area of the bus depot. Before police finally broke up the crowd with tear gas, they beat and injured at least 20 persons of both races and both sexes. After the Montgomery riots, the Kennedys are feeling betrayed. There's John Sigenthaler lying in a pool of his own blood, and they realize that they can't work with Patterson, and they're going to have to bring in federal marshals. The Justice Department says 400 United States marshals will be in Montgomery tomorrow. They're being assembled from other southern states now, and court orders are being prepared to enable them to keep armed order if necessary. We don't need the federal marshals here in this city. The situation here is uh, well in hand, and if the outside agitators who came here and deliberately stirred up uh, this uh, controversy would go home, and the marshals go home, it would be best for everybody and the situation would return to normal very quickly. We're dedicated to this. We'll take hitting, we'll take beating. We're willing to accept death. But we're going to keep coming until we can ride from anywhere in the South, to anyplace else in the South. distracting but I thought it would be a little we tried to change this up a little bit and do it a little differently I think it's best when somebody asks a question to hear it from your own voice um, I like it the best, that way and I'm sure gentlemen you don't mind at all um, so what we're gonna have to do is just um, rate if you have a question just please raise your hand and Jen is going to come to you and hand you the mic and you can ask your question to any of the panelists and then we'll start from there do we have anybody who wants to go first 
here, what, on. It's on. Okay, there we go. Oh, I can't tell which one is mine because I have a mic on. That was intelligent. <laughs> I know there's some questions in the back. Eyes all hands up. So you want to have We have one written question already, so I don't want to. Okay, well, you can go straight to the back. We'll save this if we, there we go, right there. When many of these freedom riders were injured by these um, police officers, what, what, did the hospitals, were they reluctant to treat them? Because these, some of these uh, freedom riders were se severely injured. Uh, in, in some cases, the hospitals were very reluctant to receive the freedom riders. Uh, and in fact, uh, in Aniston, the mob pursued them to the hospital and threatened them at the hospital. And so they, they then moved them to another hospital. Uh, and so it, it was very dangerous if you got caught in the middle. Uh, but the hospitals were very reluctant to treat the freedom riders. Which, which, in reality, is no surprise, given that you're in Mississippi and Alabama. Hey, thank you. Um, my question is, given that the heat of the battle that you were in, especially as nonviolent people, at what point in your lives did you come to appreciate fully the magnitude of what you endeavored and what you accomplished? Well, I think uh, I continue to uh, sort of marvel by what I see uh, that demonstrates for me the impact of what was a movement largely of young, average age, 19 of the Freedom Riders, though you had some older adults who were a part of it, Jim Peck you just saw on the screen. Uh, but, so I still marvel at it. And, and yet I'm very grateful that there were enough students and persons who felt a feeling for a cause that was bigger than any individual but could have lasting impact on transforming uh, a nation uh, and breaking down barriers that, that were in existence. So I'm still trying to uh, digest or grasp the full measure of what it is, because I don't think any one movement can define the progress that's been made. That's a major piece of it. Selma becomes critical. And Bloody Sunday becomes critical. It leads to what? Uh, voting the Civil Rights Act, right? So that, so all those things, so I marvel, but the thing I am very appreciative of is that whereas in 61, I saw no African-American uh, law enforcement officer. Now, in Jackson, for example, the superintendent, I understand, of Parchman is African-American. Female. When I went back for the first time after the Freedom Rides, uh, years later, the uh, chief of police was African-American and a woman. And you had a chief judge who had retired of the Supreme Court in, in the state of Mississippi. So, and then when I see young people like persons handling the cameras, young people in school, doctors, lawyers, you name it, engineers, I, just to name, technicians, uh, it makes me know that ordinary individuals in a collective movement at whatever risk they're willing to take, help change this nation, and we must continue to make sure this nation evolves into what a, a king calls the beloved community. So I marvel at that, at what's happening. Thank you. It is very difficult to watch that clip. Uh, question, to your knowledge, was anybody ever brought upon charges for the attacks on the, the people in the Freedom Rides? 
I can't respond to that. I, I truly, I truly don't know. You see, once we were incarcerated, or once we were arrested, we were rather ignorant as to what was going on outside. Um, it wasn't as if we got a newspaper every day. We had no transistors in jail. Um, we were truly cut off. Um, again, you know, as I had suggested previously, out of those 400 and some people in, who were freedom riders, um, we really didn't know one another. We didn't, we didn't have visitors. So I, I, I really don't know, perhaps from a historical yeah, point of view. You know, I, I don't recall anyone being prosecuted, but I would add that if anyone had been prosecuted, Not there guilty. is no doubt in my mind yeah. that an all-white jury in yeah. Alabama would yeah. have said not guilty. Yeah, very good. Right. At least, at least with respect to the freedom rights. Right. A follow-up to that. Uh, at that particular time, before the Civil Rights Act, was there any uh, federal law or lever that uh, could be used uh, to bring charges against those people? Well, the federal level? Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead, uh, I think it, it was, there might have been a law that dealt with voting rights. And so if you could show that someone had deliberately interfered with someone in, in the attempt to vote, then you could bring a lawsuit against them. Uh, but even there, you would have to prove that there was an intent to prevent them from voting uh, and that it had occurred during the act of voting. And so if it had happened before they reached the polling place or after they left the polling place, that was not part of voting. Uh, so it was, it, was, it was very narrowly defined. So at that point in time, the, the levers for federal intervention were very, very few. I have a question about whether you were personally uh, trained in civil disobedience before you got on the bus. <laughs> um, how should we go through this one? And nonviolence, nonviolent tactics as well. In, in other words, were, they, were we trained in order to know what to do in case we met some violence. Um, one of the misnomers that everybody that was a freedom rider went through some training about nonviolence. That, that's far from real. I know those in Nashville because many of them in Nashville had one of the main characters who did much of the training because of the influence he had from having studied Gandhi and gone to India, that is a fellow named Jim Lawson. And so Diane Ash, that all those, and so they went through much of the training. Uh, and we must give that Nashville group credit for keeping the Freedom Ride from not ending uh, because of what you heard on the screen. So in, in terms of the sit-ins, it was just a matter of you learning how to protect yourself. We taught that a little bit, but some, some went to much more training than, than some others. Mine was just that what, what to do if you are beaten, how to protect your, your head and so forth. Well, uh, even with all of that, when someone got pipes and clubs, there's not too much protecting you can do of yourself. In fact, John Lewis, Congressman Lewis, talks about how in South Carolina, a guy had beat him with a crate. And that gentleman, years later, came to him at his office in the Congress and apologized for having hit him, uh, which is a tribute to that gentleman who did that. So I, I don't know of all, but Dion may I know you didn't okay, go to look, the there, there is You was on the job training. <laughs> yeah. Um, you, heard, you heard me say earlier that I had been involved in sit-ins around D.C. I have never had, did not have, any type of training in nonviolence. And once again, here it comes, Rich. Let's put it this way. There are those of us and those of us who are freedom riders who believe in nonviolence as a philosophy. There are those of us who believe in nonviolence as a religious um, credo. Then there are those of us who, like me, consider nonviolence as a tactic. I assure you, if you hit me off of a picket line, if I'm on the picket line, I'm nonviolent. But if I walk off of that picket line, you spat, spit, or anything else with me, I'm going to try my darndest to lose my shoe up your butt. See, 
and, and that's important because we got to remember that there was a real mix of individuals on these freedom islands. Atheists, <laughs> you know, religious persons, persons, agnostics, young, old, you name it. Uh, and trying to get all of them to agree to a way of life uh, as nonviolence. He's right. There's some of us who believe that it is a way of, of life itself. It's a philosophy about living. Uh, it's the ideology we uh, live by. And there are others who saw it as a practical. Now, all of us had to deal with it from a practical sense, because if we didn't, some of us would not be here right now. Yeah, after all, I mean, look, we had no guns. We had no pipes. They had, they had the military. Let me bear with you for a moment. I want to take you on this journey. I don't know how many of you have ever seen the changing of the guard at Buckingham Palace. But nevertheless, it's a very rigid and organized thing. The bus ride between Montgomery and Jackson, hear me out. Helicopters flying overhead, state police cars and military cars in front of the bus. State police cars and military jeeps behind the bus. When we get to the Mississippi State Line, on either side, on the Alabama side, at least for 100 yards, um, National Guardsmen on either side of the road. Now, here's the other thing. On the bus with us were National Guardsmen with bayonets. Now, I don't know if we were so silly or I was so silly. We thought we were being protected. But you know, those National Guardsmen were indeed local people. They had the same prejudices as the people who were trying to harm us. At the, at the state line on the Mississippi side, a replication or replicas of what happened on the, the Alabama side. Mississippi National Guardsmen on either side of the road for about 100 yards and state police in front of the bus, state police behind the bus, the same thing. Um, and then to get into Jackson and then as soon as we get off the bus, you know, we are arrested right away. But my point here is that we thought we were being protected. All through the South, we thought the FBI was our friendly neighbor. <laughs> Those are the same guys who have to go to the same country clubs as the people who are out in the street trying to kick us in the butt. Um, you know, we were young, we were youthful, we were exuberant. <laughs> um, but, but at any rate, um, I, I think that probably shows you some of the stuff we had to go through. You know, if, if I could add just one thing, people, for, uh, the Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth, who was in oh, Birmingham, boy, boy, boy. said one third of the police officers in Birmingham were members of the Ku Klux Klan. Yeah. 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 Uh, and, and we now know that the FBI had an informant, uh, Gary Rowe was an informant for the FBI. He was, Gary Rowe was a member of the Ku Klux Klan, reporting everything back to J. Edgar Hoover. Hoover knew what was going to happen before it happened. He did not sell the Attorney General. And so law enforcement was in bed with the Klan in the South, and when it wanted to be, the FBI was in bed with the Klan. Wow. Those are the facts. All right. I'm curious about um, your impressions about the proportion of women that were in the Freedom Riders and um, were, did you observe gender differences in their roles and their participation? Well, in terms of percentage, um, from the reports we, we get, it was about a third were women. About a third of the Freedom Riders were women. I forget the breakdown in terms of white versus African American and, and the like, uh, but that was uh, the number that is being reported by the third word. The other part of the question was not just the number. You. Well, surely, I, I mean, it, yeah. What? Surely, Diane Ash comes to comes to mind uh, because the men in the group in Nashville turned over that leadership to Diane Nash. To, to conduct this meeting, to understand what was being held, to make a decision about whether to continue uh, the rides. So that, that's important to note, that Diane Ash, who's still around. In fact, it was Diane, Diane that the, the Attorney ahead. General and Siegenthaler, you know, called. 
Yeah, I that mean, was nice. that, that was the contact between the federal government yeah. and the Freedom Riders. I mean, there were other women that played roles, like, you know, it would take a long time to say specifics what their roles were. But yeah, there were, there were major roles women played. Uh, uh, and, and of course, because uh, we, we also living at a time when the whole patriarchal system was still pretty much the system we, we worked through uh, in the 60s. <coughs> and pretty much still today. <laughs> Good evening. Yeah, we have the uh, mic coming to you next. We have a gentleman in the back. And I'm just going to make a general judgment here that we are cutting the last clip because you'd rather ask questions, correct? Yes. Okay. And we, it's all online and it's all always playing, so you can see it as well. Um, gentleman in the back. Yes. Good evening. Understanding that there was a federal law and statute already in place to protect uh, those individuals. Uh, on their interstate travel, um, at what point was the actions or the non-actions of the states, cities, and the police departments of the of the southern states who engaged in the actions that we've seen here on the uh, on the uh, the screen here? At what part was there criminal or considered a chargeable criminal action by the federal government, and how come no one? ever pursue any type of legal action towards them for not stopping it or impeding it Is or either. The ICC? Uh, and, and initially the Supreme Court decision. Mm -hmm. So what we have to understand is that in December of 1960, the US Supreme Court says that there cannot be uh, right. segregation in interstate travel. But there's not yet a federal statute, a federal mm -hmm. law that has been passed by the Congress. And so what the Kennedy administration did in May after the Freedom Rides began was to petition the Interstate Commerce Commission, the ICC, for an order uh, which would then go into effect. And the ICC issued this order in September of 1961 to go into effect in November of 1961. And it said that on all interstate carriers, meaning buses and trains, that there would be a little placard that said seating is without respect to race, color, uh, creed or national origin. And furthermore, that if a interstate carrier, if, if, you have this, if you continue to have discrimination at a bus terminal, then the bus line can no longer stop at that terminal. And in essence, the local town would lose its bus service. Uh, so it, the, the problem was that the Supreme Court decision was not yet being enforced by the Kennedy administration. And that is politics. We have a Democratic president who was talking with Democratic governors. These are his team. These are his guys. And he needs them to get reelected in 1964. Yeah. And so the politics is we're not going to charge anybody. We want to turn down the noise and work out a solution. Uh, and I don't want to you know, go on and on. But the Kennedy administration made a deal with Senator James Eastland of Mississippi. Yeah. When the Freedom Riders get to Jackson, we're going to protect them. Mississippi is going to protect them. Mississippi is not going to allow any violence to happen to them because we're going to whisk them to jail immediately. And we're going to put them in jail for their own protection, and that was a compromise with evil. We're not going to enforce the Supreme Court decision. We're just going to allow you to put them in prison for their own safety. That's what happened. Breach of peace. And, and breach of the peace means whatever law enforcement wants it to be. That's right. <laughs> so basically, just to piggyback what you're saying, so basically, they did not have to adhere to the Supreme Court ruling. That's what it sounds like. Yes. Yes, yes that's, that's what it was. Right, they did. And so it would take the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Because, I mean, what this does is really to light the fire that leads to the Civil Rights Act of 1964, right. that there will be no segregation in any places of public accommodation. Restaurants, hotels, buses, lunch counters, so, that, that's what it took. So, so the other part to that, so it needed to have Congress to sanction, not sanction, but to... To pass a law. Pass a law, even though the Supreme Court had, pat, had passed a ruling. That is correct. My but, yeah. but the other well, Supreme Court ruling was regarding the Interstate Commerce Commission's um, activity, but it, 
it was Lyndon Johnson who signed the Civil Rights Act of... I understand. Okay, I'm sorry. Forgive me. My, I, I just have, just bear me, I have like three, that was my first and I just have two more if y'all don't mind. With the change today with the Supreme Court and changing some of the civil uh, voting rights act and watching this film and watching and listening to you three gentlemen about what has happened because I was a little girl when all of this was going on like this and I'm sitting here and my heart cries because they have made changes and a lot of people have paid their lives for us to be able to be in a black American, for me to be able to vote and have certain liberty, liberties that has just been given to other people without any issue. So how do you feel, all three of you, how do you feel with these changes because you put your life on a line and it changed. And and with a lot of the states, with a lot of the laws. She's really emotional about it, yeah. It's almost, I feel like they're trying to take us back. And it hurts because this is my country. My grandparents, my parents, they've all paid dues. And you say, there is change. There has been some change. But you know, it feels like they're trying to take us back. Let's start with the reverend. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm going to try to put on my, my pastoral hat here, because I sort of <laughs> feel you. Yeah. I, I, I feel the emotion. Uh, and you're expressing it in a very emphatic way. My message is that, yes, there are challenges to the progress that has been made, specifically as it relates to voting arrangements. There are efforts, if, we, if we're clear about it and want to be uh, honest about it, being way, waged to sort of set us back and keep persons from voting. But the, for me, it is. We got to be diligent in challenging systematic uh, activity to restrict voting, voter IDs, and all this stuff, and and understand that we got to go to the polls too when when we vote. So I feel you, and and of course. Those of us who've lived through those experiences ache in our heart when we don't see persons, number one, register to vote when the sacrifice, right, and then going to the polls to vote. And anything that restricts that, that's what we got to be diligent about, challenging. And so I, I figure. And, uh, it's all right. Believe me, we all do. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'd really like to add to what Reggie has suggested. I feel as if I have failed. Yeah. I keep suggesting that almost anyone under 40 doesn't know what existed previously. They merely think what is is what was. I have failed because, in a way, I think I have almost taken the position that I made my contribution and I'm kind of laying back on my laws as to what was done. You can't do that. You got to keep pushing. And you have a responsibility for teaching your kids, your grandkids, about the history of this country and to make certain that they are not of the opinion that what is always was, and as has been said before by me and by, I, I think, suggested by all of us, and by you. If we don't watch out, the same thing is going to come back again. So that, that's, again, what I was talking about. What is past is prologue. 
You better know your past and respond to it. That's it. No, and I mean, that is the mission here, is that we want to look at the Constitution, we want to look at the rights that the Constitution spells out, and be a part of the conversation about what the Constitution means and where it sides. So we really need to have dialogue about what this Constitution says and what these laws say as well. So do you want to respond and kind of look at kind of those pieces of the Constitution and the, the, the acts? Well, you know, I mean, the Voting Rights Act was designed to enforce the right to vote. I mean, and basically back in the 1960s, the literacy tests were being abused to prevent yeah. people from voting. Yeah. And so the Voting Rights Act suspended the literacy test. Uh, but today there are new ways that can be used to prevent people from voting, whether it is a voter ID yeah. uh, that's you know, issued by the state and has an expiration date, or you, know, you have to prove, have a birth certificate to and be And that is actually prove, another program where we'll stuff. talk about yeah. both sides of the voter ID as yeah. well. <laughs> right, so I mean, again, as, as the Reverend said, we have to be diligent, uh, but, and, and we have to know the law and know that we have rights and use them. And, and the value of programs like this is that, I mean, I agree that most people under 40 probably don't know that the Freedom Rides ever occurred. Yeah. Uh, and there are people who will never read a book who will watch a movie. And this is why the, you know, the media is so important. Uh, now, if this was a video game, all the young people would know about it, right? <laughs> so may, maybe we need to get this into like, you know, history as a video game or some kind of app you can just look at it on your, on your cell phone. It's like uh, Halo, the Freedom Riders. Yes, yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, but programs like this are so important because this is our way to help not only the people here, but you know, younger people who may be in the audience uh, sure. know this history uh, and know what was done so that we have the rights that we have today. But and if we don't fight to keep them, we will lose them. And it, what I think is, and I said this in the beginning, and this is a perfect moment because we do have to wrap up now, is really hearing from the people that can tell us the perspective from history, but also from your first perspective, from your experience. And so you have not, and please in any way, have not failed. You've shared it with this group, with the film, and with everybody. What you have done for all of us is amazing. And I know everybody in here is going to very hold this very true. This experience for us, we feel genuinely special and just honored to be here with all of you. So can we give them a big round of applause? I usually do a little of uh, when. I, I promise, I sorry, I cut you off, but the gentleman in the red vest would like to ask a question, and okay, then we're going to wrap up. You are a grand finale. Thank you. Uh, it's more of a Make it good. Okay. <laughs> in terms of my understanding of history. Professor, I believe you're correct that there was a great ambivalence because of the political process and the entrenched nature, nature of the Democratic Party at the time as being the segregationist party in this country, which now has become the Republican Party. So with that as a background, the Kennedy administration was trying to jawbone these people. They were trying to get them to do the right thing, even though they were incapable of knowing what right or wrong was. There was an act on the, on the books called the 1866 Civil Rights Act. And it wasn't until the death of Goodwin, Schwerner, and Cheney that they actually said jawboning isn't working and we're going to put the hammer down. And they said, and as a former public official who's now retired, you cannot deprive anybody's civil rights without substantive and procedural due process under law. And that has been on the books since 1866. And it was the Republican Party in, in 1876 that made a deal with the, with the South, the Democratic South, that if Hayes is made president and Tilden is not, we will pull federal troops out of the South and end Reconstruction. And it was with that act, with that decision, that really put the 1866 Civil Rights Act under the covers. And it's not until these Freedom Rides and the frustration of the, administ the Kennedy administration that they turned around and said, enough, when Goodwin, Schwerner, and Cheney yeah. were killed. Yeah. And, as you, and as you say, it takes the, the politics often trumps the law. And so we can have a law on the books and people will ignore it for almost 100 years. And so, and now we begin the anniversary of the Reconstruction Amendments and yep. three years of dialogue around those amendments and how they affect us today. So I think it's a very, thank you very much yes, for a very good you. wrap up. Now please, again, we are going to move downstairs to the Kennedy exhibit. Can I make one quick thing before you leave? Yes. It's, it's something I usually do, it's a kind of cheering us off. Yes. 
when we leave. What we hadn't talked about is how music played a major role uh, in terms of, of the incarceration arrest. And there were songs that were sung, many of them drawn from Negro spirituals. Words then translate, transform into words reflecting the movement. And I, I usually do a little song at the end uh, that, that if you don't mind, I do it, I do it real quickly. Uh, I'm a little hoarse, but I think we might still be able to work it out. And it just says, Oh, freedom. Oh, freedom. Oh, freedom, oh, freedom over me. And before I be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord and be free. Then we say, no more Jim Crow. No more Jim Crow. No more Jim Crow over me. And before I'll be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave and go home and go home to my Lord and be free. That's it.